Hello, and this short video is a follow-up to a previous video that I made in which I discuss my sacred temple experiences, specifically uh, my visit to Hagia Sophia in uh, Constantinople, Istanbul in September of 2000, uh, my visit to Roskilde Cathedral in Denmark in 2001, my visit to Uppsala Domkirka in Sweden in 2006, and my visit to Nidaros Dome in Trondheim, Norway in 2008, right? But in this video, I want to focus on something that I obtained in Istanbul in September of 2000. And, you know, um, after I went to Hagia Sophia, you know, the, I decided, you know, I was thinking in my head, I need to have a, a souvenir of this. This is a major, major, major like accomplishment, a major, you know, milestone in my life that I actually have been to Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, you know. So I decided, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want a stupid souvenir like a postcard or t-shirt or something stupid like that. I want something special. So the day before I was supposed to leave Istanbul, I went around and, uh, you know, um, I went to an internet cafe and I looked around and uh, I... Um, found out about the numismatics shops in in Istanbul, of which there are many, right? And um, I went to a specific numismatic shop and I bought a coin, specifically a Byzantine coin from the reign of the Emperor Pocas, right? And the Emperor Pocas was in power between 547 and 610, right? So this is one. This is the uh, one of the la This is one of the last emperors of the uh, East Roman Empire proper, and you know, Byz and, and Byzantine history. Byzantine history is divided into two periods, right? Two, into two major periods, and I mean, John Julius Norwich uses a different. Okay, John Julius Norwich, who who is an expert historian on Byzantium and Venice. He divides this into three periods, which is, you know, the early centuries, the apogee, and the decline and fall. That's John Julius Norwich, right? But, uh, you know, another, and he's the expert, and I'm going to put a link in the description where you, where you can buy his books. He wrote three volumes on the history of Byzantium, which I've read. Um, I've read him, you know, um, he's excellent. I mean, he's the best. I, I, just read his books and listen to what he has to say about Byzantium from a specialist perspective, okay? This is just my hypothesis here. Um, you know, for my own look into the, the situation with the Byzantine history is that, you know, you can divide the empire history into two sections. You can, you can look at, you know, the, the, the East Roman empire proper, which happened from Constantine to Heraclius. And then, you know, the post, uh, the, you know, the, the medieval Byzantine polity, which happens from, you know, after the rise of Islam, because what happened is when Islam, when Islam uh, rose, uh, Islam conquered, uh, you know, pretty much two thirds of the Byzantine Empire, you know, Syria, the Levant, Egypt, North Africa, and Spain, you know, so, uh, yeah, so when that happened, when when you know the Byzantine, when the, when the, when the, when those provinces were lost to Islam. Uh, the East Roman Empire ceased to be, and it became just the Byzantine polity. So, which finally fell to the Ottoman Turks, Mehmed II, in 1453. So, uh, this Pocas, Pocas is the next to last emperor of the East Roman Empire, right? So, um, after him came Heraclius, which is the famous one, right? The Heraclean dynasty, which is the Heraclius, is the famous emperor. I believe he's a saint. You know, he was the last. He was the first crusader, technically. He's the one who had to deal with the rise of Islam, the Byzantine Arab Wars, which happened um, in, in, in six six hundred and thirty is when Islam began to rise, when uh, the tribes in the jihad became unified, etc. And then they went on to conquer. First, they conquered the Persian Empire. And, you know, when uh, the Islam conquered Persia, the Byzantines sort of like stayed out of it and looked the other way because the historical enemy of the East Roman Empire had been the Persian Empire. 
So when Islam conquered Persia, the Byzantines stay out, looked the other way and say, you know, didn't get involved. But that was a mistake because in allowing Islam to take over Persia, they weakened their own position, right? But, um, I mean, the rise of Islam was inevitable. I mean, the Byzantine Empire, the East Roman Empire by, by 600, by 600, by the mid-600s, the, the East Roman Empire was already an obsolete uh, polity. It was just, it was, you know, it, you couldn't, it couldn't have been sustained any longer, you know, so... And I mean, by, by East Roman Empire, I mean the, the preservation of Roman, of the Roman social norms and the Roman institutions and the idea of Roman law, etc., which was codified by the Emperor Justinian and all these things. With the exception, though, that in, um, in the East Roman Empire, of course, there was the addendum of, of Orthodox Christianity, which was not there in the Pagan Roman Empire. The Battle of Jarmok, the Battle of Jarmok in 636 resulted in a crushing defeat for the larger Byzantine army. Within three years, the Levant was lost. By then, most of Egypt had fallen to Islam. So basically, okay, the Battle of Jarmok in 636. And what happened in that battle is that the forces, the military forces of Islam, you know, crushed the Byzantine army. And that was the end of the East Roman Empire. I mean, um, it, it was the equivalent of what happened in August of 2021 when the Taliban won the war in Afghanistan. The Taliban broke the power of the United States. The same thing here during the Battle of Jormuk. The armies of the Islamic tribes, you know, the, the Arab tribes, you know, um, inspired and motivated by Islam, broke the power of Rome in that battle. And, and that was the end. I mean, the, the East Roman Empire lost the Levant, Egypt, and Syria. You know, so once the Byzantine, the, the East Roman Empire lost Egypt, they lost their breadbasket. So they were, um, you know, before that, you know, it was Egypt that supplied the grain for the Byzantine, the, the East Roman Empire. And when they lost that, they lost their breadbasket. So uh, for what I understand, the diet in, 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 in the Byzantine polity changed. And also it forced the Byzantines, I think it was the Emperor Heraclius himself who set up the theme system and the theme system was uh, sort of like mandated agriculture precisely to feed the population. So, uh, uh, you know, farmers doubled as soldiers. So in peacetime, the soldiers were farmers and in wartime, they would be drafted for the army. That's the theme system. And then it divided into, into districts, the, the polity was divided into provincial, sort of provincial uh, subsets. And it was administered by a bureaucracy, the Byzantine bureaucracy. And this is why this theme system is the reason why Karl Marx, you know, well, Karl Marx formulated a, a hypothesis of the Asiatic mode of production. It was one of the modes of production that, are, you know, he, he thought about adding that to the formal, I mean, the modes of production in Marxist historiography, in historical materialism, you have, you know, you have a primitive communism, you have a slavery, you have feudalism, you have capitalism, and then you have socialism, which is a transition to communism, right? That's the system. However, for a while there, Karl Marx entertained the possibility of including, because these means of production only apply to Western, you know, Western history. You know, so he thought, well, what about China and, all this other, and India and all these other places? So Marx tried to formulate this idea of the Asiatic mode of production to accommodate um, the mode of production prevalent in Han China, and then other Marxists, you know, sort of like applied the same thing to Byzantium and the Incas. So heretical Marxists who, uh, you know, I mean the mainstream Marxists, most of most of the Marxists, if you go to like the Marxist uh, Marxist students, um, if you go to you know Communistic Apartheid, if you go to if you go to the Grundkurs. Averes Communistic Party, you know the, the ground course. You know, if, if you talk to you know Marxist Leninists or or Trotskyist Marxists, they would say that this is a her heresy that Marx dropped that. That is, but but there are some historians that still use that to like uh, classify the Incas, Han China, and the Byzantine Empire after the theme system was adopted, right? So. Um, but that came later under Emperor Heraclius. Now, back to Pocas. Now, the man who I need to talk about is Pocas, right? Not Heraclius, but Pocas. 
Pocas right here and here is this is the Wikipedia Pocas. This is Pocas, Emperor Pocas, Emperor Pocas right here. Pocas, right? Emperor Pocas. Right. And you know, it, you know, Pocas has been vilified. Uh the Emperor Pocas has been vilified very badly. I mean, he is said to have been a, a ruthless tyrant in the, in the same line as Nero or Caligula in the in the in the original empire uh, also from wikipedia yeah it says here quote surviving sources are universally extremely hostile to pocas he he is described as an incompetent tyrant and usurper who brutally purged any real or perceived opposition and left the empire wide open to foreign aggression uh, the veracity of these sources is difficult to ascertain since emperors of the Heraclean dynasty who succeeded Pocas had a vested interest in tarnishing his reputation. Because what happened was, of course, that the emperor Heraclius staged an armed revolt. Uh, Heraclius had been ex-arch of Africa. So uh, he was the military, military governor of Africa, which Africa then didn't mean like today the whole continent of Africa. Roman Africa was just basically North Africa and Egypt. And uh, anyways, the exarch of Africa, I mean, Pocas, the charge against Pocas was that he, he was a hedonist and sitting in, you know, looking at chariot races in the Hippo Hippodrome, that he was a, a hedonist that was unconcerned, um, you know, with military affairs. And apparently the Persian Empire invaded, you know, the, the, the Byzantine provinces and, and whatever, and Pocas didn't do anything about it. And, you know, from the perspective of the church got, you know, the church became alarmed because the Persians are invading the Levant. They're, they're threatening to take Jerusalem. What are you doing? Pocas, what are you doing? So he was seen as an incompetent emperor. And what happened was that in Heraclius' stage, uh, basically an armed rebellion, a coup, overthrew him, seized Jerusalem, excuse me, seized Constantinople and had her, had Pocas executed on the same day. And, you know, for what I've written, John Julius Norwich, uh, History of Byzantium, was summoned before Heraclius. Heraclius asked, asked him, is this how you manage the empire? And uh, Pocas replied, what else am I supposed to do? So because of that, Pocas is, is, is said to be a cynical, tyrannical, hedonist, uh, incompetent, or what have you. But again, like it says here in this citation, you know, and, and this is just Wikipedia, I'm, you know, I'm going to put links in the description to other sources and Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever, but, you know, the veracity of these sources is difficult to ascertain, right? So, and, you know, you have to understand in Byzantine history, what is said about the emperors is might not be accurate because, for example, the, um, I believe his name was Procopius, he was a historian that, you know, he wrote a history, a biography of the Emperor Justinian, right? And, and the official biography was full of praise for this Emperor Justinian. He's so pious. He, he dedicated Hagia, Hagia Sophia to Jesus Pantocrator. You know, he is, the, oh, he's such a benevolent ruler. Uh, he codified Roman law and blah, blah, blah. But then he went home and wrote a secret history when he, where he tells the truth about Justinian. You know, that he was a tyrannical, megalomaniatic, um, a rapacious person, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. He, he was, he was immoral. Uh, you know, he, his Christianity was just, he only paid lip service to Christianity. Basically the, the, the picture that Procopius paints of Justinian in the secret history is of a man who used piety, religious and legal, you know, religious piety and, and, and legal, whatever le legal and religious piety, you know, the codification of Roman law and dedication of the Hagia Sophia to, Christ Pantocrator, that was a smokescreen, a veneer that hid the tyrannical, you know, aspects of and, and modus operandi of uh, Justinian. Okay, so that's why in Byzantine history, you know, you gotta be careful. You can't just, yeah, you know, you know, you know, Pocas is not around to talk about his side of it, right? Pocas, I mean, there, this, you know, Pocas's side of it, we don't know. We know only Heraclius' side of it. So, but yeah, anyways, uh, here's another coin of Pocas in Wikipedia. They have a thing about it. Yeah, here's another coin. This is, this is probably a nicer coin. This is a golden word, that gold coin right here from Pocas, right? This is the gold coin version. Okay. Mine is just a cheap Cooper coin. This is just a cheap Cooper coin. Mine is just a cheap Cooper coin. Cheap, uh, you know, Cooper, whatever. This is the gold version. 
right? Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, in the back of the coin that I have, there is this little, um, I don't know, it's like a symbol or whatever. In the back, it's like an, yeah, this symbol right here. And, you know, I've always, I don't know what that is. I've always speculated as to what that is. So, actually, I asked an expert at, when I was at the University of Uppsala. Uh, I went to look at the sil silver Bible that they keep there in Uppsala, in the, in, you know, <clears throat> in the University of Uppsala. I went to look at the silver Bible and whatever. And uh, the guy who gave me the tour was a professor that was friends with a friend. He was the father of a friend. So he gave me a really nice tour and explained everything. And, you know, and he was he's really a, an expert, expert historian, academic historian. So I took the opportunity to ask him, hey, look, I have this coin from the Byzantines, you know, you know, and I wonder what this is. Have, can you tell me? Any, have you ever seen this? Can you tell me what it is? And he says, oh, it is very possible that that was the seal of the emperor that when um, the emperor issued an edict, it had to be... Uh, the signature was the imprimatur of his seal, so that was probably it, he said. So that is that is what that is what an expert told me. This is probably so. Yeah, so that would be yeah, the seal of Pocas. Yeah. So yeah. Anyways, so this is a coin of Heraclius, right? This will be a coin of Heraclius, the one who succeeded Pocas, the exarch of Africa who overthrew Pocas and took over as emperor. And it was him, he was the first crusader. He's the one who had to deal in, with that, you know, that final battle. You know, when, um, yeah, uh, the battle of Jarmuk in 636, which was the end of the Byzantine polit the Byzantine Empire, essentially. It's an interesting one. See, see, you can see the Byzantine, the Byzantine knight. Fighting the, the Arab Muslims, right? That's emblematic right there. You see the Arabs with the scimitars. and Yeah, that's the Battle of Dermuk, right? The Byzantine knight against the two Muslims. And yeah, so, yeah, that was the first, yeah. That's the battle that sealed the fate of the East Roman Empire. Yeah. So, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Bye.